Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 3. In this section, we're going to talk about a spherical Earth. Things that orbit move around spherical objects, or at least mostly spher spherical objects. I'm going to explain how the ancients discovered that the Earth we live on is a sphere, and later how they figured out its size relative to the Moon and the Sun. There will be a lot of geometry in this section and some algebra. I'm going, going to describe some of the ways the ancients figured out the relative sizes of the Earth, Moon, and Sun, and how they figured out the Earth is a sphere. You don't need to know these things in order to understand orbital dynamics. The stuff in this section is pretty basic. I do, however, want to go over some of the geometry the ancients used. Figuring out orbits is one thing. Figuring out how things that orbit can be used requires a lot of geometry and a lot of algebra. The ancients first thought the Earth was flat. The world we live in does feel flat. We navigate around the world with flat maps. We refer to the start and end of days as sunrise and sunset. The sun doesn't really rise and doesn't really set. When we travel away from the center of the Earth, we say we're going up. If we travel towards the center of the Earth, we say we're going down. We model local trajectories as parabolic motion. I'll show you much later why that's wrong. So how did the ancients figure out the Earth was spherical? Let's start with an ancient cosmological model that Aristotle developed. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher and a student of Plato. He's one of the most important founding figures in Western philosophy. He developed a theory that explained the motion of objects in the universe. Objects close to Earth had, as he saw it, an innate desire to get to the center of the Earth, which, from his point of view, was the center of the universe. That kept things close to Earth, like rocks, people, and buildings. Objects far away were, in his view, perfect spheres traveling in perfect circles. Aristotle devised 55 celestial spheres that carried the planets and the points of light we refer to as stars. He didn't have a theory for why these distant objects stayed in their celestial sphere. A unified physical model didn't come until Newton in the 1700s. Aristotle's model confirmed the perfection of his universe in that it was made up of perfect spheres circling in perfect circles which was evidence that the gods created the universe. In this model, the Earth was fixed and everything else moved around it. Aristotle proved that the Earth is a sphere by observing a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse is when the moon passes behind the Earth and passes through the shadow of the Earth. It starts and ends with a full moon, and during the eclipse, it results in a red moon. Here's an animation that shows this. Look at the image of the moon on the lower left. The shadow cast is circular. That led Aristotle to believe the Earth was spherical. If the Earth were flat, you'd get a circular shadow some of the time. At other times, the flat Earth would be tilted away from the moon and would look elliptical. Here, the shadow cast by the Earth wouldn't be circular. The Earth's shadow was circular for every lunar eclipse Aristotle observed. Aristotle figured the Earth had to be spherical. You can see here the burnt orange color that the moon takes on during a full eclipse. Why burnt orange? In this picture that just appeared, the sun is on the right and the moon is completely in the Earth's shadow. This is when the moon is a burnt orange color. This is the same color we see during sunsets. During a lunar eclipse, the moon appears burnt orange for the same reason that a sunset is burnt orange. Blue light from the sun is scattered by our atmosphere. That's why the daytime sky looks blue. At the same time, the sun looks yellowish. In space, the sun is pure white. When the sun is low on the horizon, most of the blue light is scattered away and what's left is the burnt orange light. That's the same effect that occurs during a lunar eclipse. Aristotle observed that different stars are visible at different latitudes at the same time of the year. Aristotle wrote there are stars seen in Egypt and Cyprus which are not seen in the northerly regions. This could only happen on a curved surface. At the bottom of this image, you see a depiction of the Southern Cross. At the top, you see the Big Dipper. You can't see the Big Dipper from the Southern Latitudes. Likewise, you can't see the Southern Cross from the Northern Latitudes. Aristarchus was a Greek astronomer and mathematician. He studied the phases of the moon. How does the moon go through phases? They occur because of the relative positions of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. 
This animation illustrates the relative positions of the sun and the moon that create the phases of the moon. The moon phases are shown on the lower right. The relative positions are in the main panel. Notice that the moon is full when the sun and moon are at opposite sides of the earth. That's the only way you get a full moon. When the sun and moon are close to each other, they're on the same side of the earth and you get a new moon. Aristarchus studied these relative orientations. Here's an animation that demonstrates the progression of the phases of the moon and the relative position of the sun, earth, and moon. The sun is to the left. Every 27.3 days, the moon orbits the earth and from this animation, you can see how it goes through its phases. The panel on the lower right shows you how this all looks from our perspective. Aristarchus knew that during a quarter moon, the moon forms the right triangle with the sun and the earth. A quarter moon appears half lit to us. Calling it a quarter moon is really a misnomer. There are a lot of these that I'll tell you about in orbital dynamics. By observing the angle between the sun and moon, the distances to the sun and moon can be deduced. We'll use trigonometry to solve this problem. That wasn't available to Aristarchus, but he used something similar. I'm going to recreate Aristarchus' geometric constructions and many others using a software application called Geometry Sketchpad. It's a geometric visualization software for teachers, students, etc. You can work out these geometric constructions with a pencil and paper. You can also use a drawing package like Visio. Geometry Sketchpad lets you draw geometric shapes and then measure distances and angles. If you change aspects of the shape, the basic geometry stays fixed. With pencil and paper, you'd either have to start over or use an eraser. Drawing packages like Visio are great, but they don't maintain the integrity of the geometry. Geometry Sketchpad also has some cool features that you'll see in this part and in later parts. Orbital dynamics involves a lot of geometry. Some of the proofs I'll show you in later parts use nothing but geometry. A program like this is invaluable. The package is not that expensive. If you're going to study orbital dynamics, I recommend you look into it. If you understand the math behind orbital dynamics, you can predict the dynamics and the relative motions of orbiting bodies. If you understand the geometry, you'll develop a better intuition for orbital dynamics, which puts the math in better context. By the way, I'm not affiliated at all with a company that sells this product. In this video, I'm going to show you how I created this geometric construction with Sketchpad. Here's what the user interface looks like. I start by drawing a line. If I hold down the shift key, I get a horizontal line. I then want to draw a perpendicular line for the end point of my first line. I start at the end point and draw it by holding down the shift key. That locks in a vertical line. Now I create a circle center at the horizontal line end point that represents the sun. I then create a circle at the other end of the horizontal line that represents the moon. And then I create a third circle that represents the earth. I'm not going to anchor this circle to the end point of the vertical line. That allows me to move the circle along the line. I'll label the sun, and then I'll label the moon, and then I'll label the earth. And now I'll make the moon smaller so it's in somewhat proper perspective. This is an exact perspective, by the way. Now I draw a line segment from the center of the sun to the center of the earth. I've now formed a sun-moon-earth triangle. Here's the angle formed by the sun, earth, and moon. This is the angle that Aristarchus measured. And let's move the earth so that angle is close to what Aristarchus measured, 87 degrees. Now I measure the distance from the sun to the earth. Notice this in centimeters. And now I measure the distance from the sun to the moon, again in centimeters. And these are centimeters in the drawing. I want to measure the distance from the earth to the moon. I need to create a line segment from the earth to the moon in order to do that. Now I'll hide the reference line I used to place the earth in a vertical line above the moon. 
Aristarchus measured the sun-earth moon angle when the moon was at half quarter. Half quarter is when the moon looks half lit to us. It's when the earth moon sun angle is 90 degrees. So this is a right triangle. I need to add some computations. We're going to use the secant function to determine the relative distances. First, I compute the cosine of the sun, earth, moon angle. The cosine is 0 0.05. 1 over the cosine is the secant. The secant in this case is 19.13. If the cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, then the secant is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. In this triangle formed by the sun, earth, and moon, the hypotenuse is the distance from the sun to the earth. From the 87 degree angle perspective, the adjacent side is the distance from the earth to the moon. The ratio of the earth-moon distance over the sun-earth distance of, is um, 0 0.05 or the cosine of 87 degrees. The ratio of the sun-earth distance over the earth-moon distance is 19.13, or the secant of 87 degrees. If you look up the secant of 87 degrees, it's actually 19.107. In the sketchpad diagram, the angle's not 87 degrees exactly. It's something like 87.00356 degrees, close enough. The secant of 87.00356 is 19.13, and we use that value for further calculations. What this says is that the sun is 19.13 times farther away from the moon. That tells you the relative distances. What about the relative sizes? As viewed from the Earth, the sun and the moon have nearly equal apparent angular sizes, about half a degree. Extend your arm and look at your little finger. Half a degree is about half the size of your little fingernail. The sun and moon's apparent sizes are about that size. We think they're bigger. Experiment with this yourself with the moon. It's safer for your eyes if you avoid the sun. The sun and moon are actually much smaller than we perceive. The equal apparent sizes are why some solar eclipses are total. It wasn't always this way. A long time ago, the moon was closer to the Earth and thus appeared larger. Back then, it completely obstructed the sun during solar eclipses. The moon is very slowly drifting away, about one centimeter per year. Its apparent size is getting smaller. Many, many years from now, we'll see more of the sun behind the moon. Then, solar eclipses won't be total. For now, we live in the age of solar eclipses, where the relative sizes are almost the same. Aristarchus knew that the sizes of the sun and the moon must be in proportion to their distances from the Earth. If the sun was farther away, it had to be larger than the moon. If the sizes were proportional, then the diameters and volumes would be proportional. If the sun were larger, it would be larger in both diameter and volume. Aristarchus knew the relative distances. The sun is 19.13 times farther away from the Earth than the moon. That meant the proportion of the diameters was also 1.93 to 1. Next, the formula for the volume of a sphere is V equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. If we substitute 19.13 for r, we get that the volume of the sun is 28,324 times larger than the moon. The diameter of the sun is 19.13 times bigger, and the spherical volume is 28,320 times, 325 times larger. That's a very large sun in comparison to a much smaller moon. Aristarchus then went on to calculate the circumference of the sun's path around the Earth. Later on, I'm going to show you a sun-centric model. For now, let's assume an Earth-centric model. The circumferences are the same in both cases. We know the sun is 19.13 times larger than the moon. Let's express the distance to the sun in terms of lunar radii. Here you see the Earth. Let's add the sun, a distance of s away, and then add the moon, a distance of l away. The apparent size of the sun is half a degree. There are 360 degrees in a circle. If you divide 360 by half a degree, you get 720 suns. It would take 720 suns lined up end to end to fill the circumference of the circle, which is the sun's path around the Earth. Let's make a lunar radius equal to one. 
the sun is 19.13 times bigger. So it's 19.13 lunar radii. We said the sun's radius is 19.13 lunar radii, and it occupies half a degree in the sky. Half a degree is the full diameter, so that equates to 38.26 lunar radii. 2 times 19.13 is 38.26. The circumference of the sun's path around the Earth is then 38.26 times 720, or 27,547 lunar radii. The formula for circumference is 2 pi times the radius. The formula for the radius is the circumference divided by 2 pi. That's just another form of the previous equation. The distance s is the radius of our circle, the sun's path around the Earth. A circumference of 27547 divided by 2 pi is 4,384 lunar radii. That's how far the sun is away from the Earth. We can compute L by dividing S by 19.13. 4,384 divided by 19.13 is 229 lunar radii. From these calculations, we've determined the sun is much bigger and much farther away from the moon, even though their relative sizes seen from the surface of the Earth is almost identical. The sun is 19.13 times farther away, and its apparent path around the Earth has a radius of 4,384 lunar radii. The moon's path around the Earth has a radius of 229 lunar radii. That tells you the sun is really big and is very far away. Here's an original manuscript from Aristarchus. He used this construction to determine the relative size of the Earth. During a lunar eclipse, Aristarchus noted the time when the moon just entered the shadow of the Earth. He timed how long it took for the moon to pass completely into the shadow, and then timed how long it took the moon to get to the other edge. He figured out the Earth's shadow was two moon diameters. By the way, he was off by half a diameter. Here we're going to determine the relative size of the Earth in relation to the moon. I'm going to use geometry sketchpad again to construct the relative sizes and distances geometrically. Geometry sketchpad can measure distances in centimeters, inches, and pixels. We really don't care about the units, so I'll use pixels. Let's define one lunar radius to be 15 pixels. One solar radius would be 19.13 times larger than a lunar radius. That equates to 286.95 pixels. Let's define the distance from the Earth to the Moon to be 75 pixels. The distance from the Earth to the Sun would be 75 times 19.13 or 1,434.75 pixels. The distances are not proportional to the radii. If I did that, the sun, earth, and moon would get really small, or if I made the sun, earth, and moon a reasonable size, the distances would get really huge. We're trying to figure out the relative size of the earth. The radii and distances don't have to be proportional to do that. So in geometry sketchpad, Let's convert the units from centimeters to pixels. I'll create a point which will represent the sun center, and I'll label it sun center. From there, I measure 1,434.75 pixels from the sun center, and I'll set a point to the right. This locates the center of the Earth. From the Earth, I'll measure 75 pixels to the right, which locates the edge of the moon. Now. I'll label the moon edge and the Earth's center point. I'll construct a line between the sun center and the Earth center. And I'll measure it. It measures 1,434.75 pixels, which is what I specified. And I'll color this green. I'll then construct a line segment from the Earth's center to the moon edge. It measures 75 pixels, which is what I specified, and I'll color that red. I'll then draw a point along a perpendicular line that's 56.95 pixels away from the sun's center. This marks the edge of the sun. 
and I'll label it Sun Edge. I'll do something similar for the moon. I'll draw a point along a perpendicular line from the moon edge 30 pixels up. This marks the other moon edge and I'll label it moon edge too. I'll construct a line between the two moon edges. This is the diameter of the moon and it measures 30 pixels, which is what I specified. I'll bisect this line by creating a midpoint. This is the moon center, and I'll label it moon center. This line segment is the radius of the sun. It measures 286.95 pixels like I specified. I'll then measure the moon radius. It's 15 pixels, which is half of 30, like I specified. And using the calculate function, I can divide the radius of the sun by the radius of the moon. And I get 19.13, which is the ratio I derived earlier. I also calculate the distance from the sun to the earth divided by the distance from the earth to the moon. That equals 19.13, which I derived earlier. Now I'll construct a circle which represents the sun. I'll construct another circle which represents the moon. And now I'll draw a line segment from the sun edge to the moon edge. This is the shadow line. Notice this line encompasses one full moon diameter but only one sun radius. Two moons would fit in the full shadow like Aristarchus had determined. Now I'll draw A horizontal line segment and then intersect that line with the shadow line. That defines a triangle with an endpoint here, and I'll label the endpoint. Now I can draw a perpendicular line for the Earth center point. And I'll construct a point at the intersection of the shadow line. This marks the earth edge, and I'll label it earth edge. This circle represents the earth. And this line segment represents the radius of the Earth. It measures 42.76 pixels. If we divide the Earth radius by the moon radius, we get 2.85. So the Earth is 2.85 large, times larger than the moon. This is a geometric solution. Aristarchus could have derived this if he made his drawing carefully. I think he actually did this algebraically, and I'll do that next. Here's how I'll do this algebraically. Using lunar radii as, radii as our units, we know the moon is 229 lunar radii away from the Earth, and the sun is 4,354 lunar radii away from the Earth. The sun is 19.13 lunar radii in radius, and the moon is two lunar radii in diameter. This sets up three similar triangles. The length of side little s is 19.13. The length of little l is 1. This line segment is 2l since the distance is 2 lunar radii. The length of segment big S is 4,354. And the length of segment big L is 229. We want to find the length of this side, little e, which would give us the radius of the Earth expressed in lunar radii. This sets up three similar triangles with several known lengths. We have enough to solve for e. 
Let's compute the ratio of the side little s divided by big S plus big L plus big D. That's the ratio of this distance by this distance. Since we have three similar triangles, the ratio of two similar sides would be equal. The ratio of little s over big S plus big L plus big D is equal to the side E divided by L plus D. That's this distance divided by this distance. These ratios are in turn equal to twice little l over d. That's this distance divided by this distance. Little l is 1 and big L is 229. We know that s over l is 19.13. We also know that little s over little l is 19.13. We want to know e over little l. That is the ratio of the Earth's radius to the moon. Since l is 1, this is simply e. We said that little s over big S plus big L plus big D is equal to twice L over D. Let's put little l on the left and the distance S plus L plus D on the right. We can plug in some of the known values. Little s is 19.13, little l is 1, big S is 4354, big L is 229. Let's do some of the comp computations to simplify this. 19.13 divided by 2 is 9.565. 4,354 plus 229 is 4,583. To reduce the right side, we'll split the right term into 4,583 over D and D over D. D over D is 1. Now, 9.565 equals 4,583 over D plus 1. Subtracting 1 from both sides, we get 8.65 is 4,583 over D. Multiply both sides by D and divide both sides by 8.5, and we get D equals 4,583 divided by 8.565, or 535. Let's put D, the value of D into our diagram. Going back to the first equation, we know that E over L plus D equals 2L over D. E over 229 plus 535 is equal to 2 times 1 over 535, which equates to E over 764 equals 0 0.00373. Multiplying both sides by 764, we get E equals 0 0.00373 times 764, which equals 2.8559. Very close to the 2.85 result we got geometrically. In Aristarchus' solar system, the Earth is 2.85 times bigger than the Moon, and the Sun is 19.13 times bigger than the Moon. The Sun would also be 6.7 times bigger than the Earth. This picture puts the Sun, Moon, and Earth in their proper scale, but not their proper distance. Here's what they look like at proper scale and distance. The Sun is 4,354 lunar radii away from the Earth, the moon is 229 lunar radii away from the Earth. You can barely make out the moon. You can see it a little bit better this way. Because of their relative sizes, Aristarchus presented the first known heliocentric model of the solar system, placing the sun, not the Earth, at the center of the universe. He also put the other planets in their correct order of position around the sun. His astronomical ideas were rejected in, the fav in favor of the geometric theories of Aristotle and Ptolemy. It would take 1,800 years for Copernicus to reintroduce the heliocentric model and Galileo to prove it. A sun-centered solar system, as proposed by Aristarchus, did not survive long under the weight of Arist Aristotle's influence and the common sense of the day. If the Earth was in motion around the sun, why didn't it leave behind the birds flying in the air? If the Earth were spinning in an orbit around the Sun, why weren't there violent winds? At the equator, the Earth rotates within the atmosphere. Near the surface, where there is enough friction to carry the atmosphere, near the surface is enough friction to carry the Earth's atmosphere with the Earth's rotation. Higher up, from our perspective on Earth, winds go east to west, counter to the Earth's rotation. At higher levels, the atmosphere wants to stay fixed. Apparent winds do occur because of the Earth's rotation just not as much as the ancients thought there would be. If the Earth were spinning, why didn't we fly off? The speed of the Earth's rotational 
rotation at the equator is 1,670 kilometers per hour. It decreases as you head towards the poles. That's pretty fast, but it's countered by the gravitational force. At the equator, you're maybe half a pound lighter. That's not enough rotational force for you to fly off. Another objection was parallax. If the Earth were actually in an orbit around the Sun, why wasn't there a parallax effect? Stars should appear to change their position with respect to the other background stars as the Earth moved around its orbit because of viewing them from a different perspective. You're looking at the screen right now. Hold up one finger and then close one eye and now switch eyes. When you look through your right eye, everything you see appears to shift to the right. When you look through your left eye, everything appears to shift to your left. The same thing should occur as the Earth orbits the sun. It does, however, the ancient astronomers didn't realize how far away the stars were. Try looking at something that is miles in the distance. This works best if there's something else in the background miles away from what you're looking at. You notice a parallax between your right eye and left with your finger, but you wouldn't notice much with the Statue of Liberty against the Manhattan skyline if you were miles away from the statue. Both the Statue of Liberty and the skyline would be too far away. You would notice stellar parallax if you had a sensitive telescope. Otherwise, stellar parallax isn't noticeable. Aristarchus' geometry was right, but his measurements were off. The true value of the angle between the sun and the moon at quarter moon is more like 89.85277 degrees. That's what puts the sun's distance about 389 times the moon since the arc cosine of 89.85277 is 389. And that makes its volume 138,694,723 times greater. This means the sun is 149,600,000 kilometers from the earth and the distance of the moon is um, 384,400 kilometers. The distance from the Earth to the Sun varies over the year. Likewise, the distance from the Moon to the Earth varies over the 28-day lunar cycle. These are mean distances. The actual relative sizes of the Sun, Moon, and Earth are shown here. The Sun is about 400 times bigger than the Moon and about 109 times bigger than the Earth. Here you can see a very large sun, so large I can't fit it on the screen. You see a tiny Earth, and the moon is so tiny you can barely see it. If I put the relative distances with proportional sizes of the sun, moon, and Earth, you either wouldn't be able to see the sun, moon, and Earth, or the distances would not fit on a single slide. So here's my shot at describing relative sizes and distances. Mount McKinley in Alaska is 6,200 meters tall. If it were a sphere, its radius would be 3,100 meters, half its height. The sun's radius is 695,500 kilometers. In our analogy, the sun is 217,343 times larger than Mount McKinley. If Mount McKinley were the sun, the Earth would be the size of a 20-story building, a 28-meter radius or 56 meters tall. That equates to 183 feet. In terms of distance, you put Mount McKinley, 660 kilometers or 410 miles away from the 20-story building that represents the Earth. That's the distance from San Diego to San Jose. If the summer Mount McKinley and the Earth were a 20-story building, then the moon would have a 7.5-meter radius, meaning it would be 15 meters tall. That equates to 50 feet. That's about the size of a five-story building. You would then have to put it 1.7 kilometers away from Earth. That's a little less than the distance from the baseball field in San Diego to the Hotel del Coronado. If you could see San Jose from Petco Park, from uh, the ball field in San Diego, it would have a half a degree diameter apparent size. So with the five-story office building at the Hotel del Coronado. Suffice it to say, the sun is huge and very far away, and the moon is small and very close by. Their relative sizes from the Earth, however, are almost identical. I've broken this section into two parts, part three and part four. 
In this part, you've seen a lot of geometric constructions that enable the ancients to figure out the relative sizes of the Earth, Moon, and Sun and their relative distances. I do more of that in the next part.